Although the Orlando Magic are still a younger franchise when compared to the old guard of the NBA, their ride has been an eventful one. They've been to the playoffs 16 times in their 34 years of existence and to the NBA Finals twice. They've been somewhat fortunate in that each decade of their burgoo of joy and discontent has unfolded like a four-act play that repeats itself. Act 1. Land substantial talent. Aside from wooing local boy Tracy McGrady to come home during the summer of 2000, superstar wrangling in Orlando has occurred primarily through the draft. They did it with the top pick in 1992 with Shaq, and then again, miraculously, with the traded top pick in 1993 with Penny Hardaway. They did it in 2004 with the endlessly charismatic Dwight Howard. Oh, it's very important, but it starts with the D. Act 2 nearly reached the promised land. Their precocious stars reached the finals and fell short to Akeem and the Rockets in 1995, and their well-built tray chucking machine was snuffed out in the playoffs by Mamba and Pow in 2009. Act 3 grieve as that substantial talent punts their Mickey Mouse ears into the sun. Act 4 wander, retool in an effort to be competitive, and ultimately bottom out. If, as a citizen of the Magic Kingdom, reflecting on all that hoping, grieving, wandering, and bottoming out makes you say, they're all is aching. At the moment, it certainly seems that Orlando has found their way out of Act 4 and played out Act 1 yet again with the prodigious talent that they've managed to land in the past two NBA drafts. So, how real is this positive momentum for the Orlando Magic? Is any of this worthy of excitement or a deep dive? You bet your ass it is. John Hammond and Jeff Weltman are the architects of the current magic, and over the years, they've employed a strategy of draft the biggest and weirdest dudes possible and hope that one of them will turn into something special. You ever think about being weird? For a living. It's a strategy that worked for them in Milwaukee when they collected an arsenal of long limbed dudes, one of which was this mysterious Greek Nigerian dude named Giannis. Well, you gotta stick with what works. Assembling young talent is like clumsily picking out a rhythm and humming some vague melody. It's a search for something, anything that makes sense, and it's looking more and more like they've done that. If you're unfamiliar with Orlando Magic Basketball and you're wondering what the hell I'm talking about, I'd like to introduce you to two young players named Franz, Wagner, and uh, oh, uh, Paolo. Ben the Magic took Franz Wagner with the eighth pick in 2021 and Bancaro with the first overall pick in 2022. And early indications are that their partnership will be fruitful, certainly among the more positive collaborations involving Germany and Italy that the world has ever seen. We've had plenty of potent backcourt tandems over the years. We've had a number of wickedly fun wing combos. We've even had some brutally effective examples of Twin Towers. But brawny ball handling forwards who can put immense pressure on the rim, shoot it reasonably well and also facilitate? There ain't been many of those. Wagner and Paolo are using their fizzling cocktails of size, agility, power, and most importantly ball skills to pour a foundation for what the magic could become in the coming years. They get it done in similar but slightly different ways, largely because of their physical makeups. Basketball is a pressure release game, and the balance for that dynamic is different for every player. The fear of one strength opens the door for or necessitates the development of another. For Paolo, another entry in a proud and rich history of hoopers from the Pacific Northwest, and one of several players who have recently entered the league with a strong maternal hooping influence, that tension is undoubtedly in the fear that he could get to the basket. Off the dribble, Bancaro is physically shiftier than Wagner in the way that he uses hesitation and wiggly in how he can throw wide crossovers or in and out moves at defenders. He's not exceptionally twitchy or explosive, but he's far from sluggish, very flexible and mobile for his size. He's able to get his shoulders and most importantly, the ball lower to the ground so that he can turn the corner on bigger players who might get switched onto him. From a standstill position, he is a punishing player to check because he's quick and skilled with his rip through repertoire. Some might say repertoire. To the point where bigger defenders struggle to avoid overreacting and keeping him from turning the corner, and he's big enough to simply overpower mismatches that find themselves in his crosshairs. These things have helped him roast slower and smaller defenders at lower levels of play, and sometimes the simple things about great players remain true throughout their careers. The release in Bancaro's offensive game will be in his mid-range decision-making and picking his perimeter attempts judiciously. His release isn't especially quick and his touch isn't the softest, but it's not alarming or troubling. The better versions of his game will likely have his three-point 
percentage hovering in the low 30s range. I'd describe it as fine and ultimately tolerable so long as he maintains the status quo of taking what's there without hunting his shot, barring huge improvement. He's shooting 29% on all catch and shoot threes and an equally unsavory 26.9% when attempting threes off the dribble. He has an odd tendency, whether it's to avoid drawing charges or to skirt tangling with shot blockers at the rim, that feel less like wholehearted attempts and more like the absence of a real choice. Paolo is constantly drawing extra help in the paint, and he's a free throw machine. Since the 2009-10 season, only Joel Embiid and Blake Griffin have posted higher free throw attempts per game as rookies. But I'd love to see him continue to find that balance between powering his way to the square and spraying the ball back out to the perimeter. Bancaro has a lot of potential as a passer. He can throw skips, drop dimes to cutters, throw the occasional lob. Good things happen for Orlando when he makes the simplest of decisions, and it'll only get better once he gets the hang of reading the coverages that he's seeing the most often. Speaking of Griffin, Paolo has cited LeBron and Carmelo Anthony as influences, but Blake runs between those two players as an interesting benchmark for someone like Bancaro. Not quite the processing or passing virtuoso as LeBron, and not quite the face-up shot creator as Carmelo, but still a great player at his peak. Eras will probably cause the outlets for their development to be inverted. Blake entered the league as a high post scoring machine just before the geometry of the sport shifted, and he was equipped with a scoring and passing skill set that could adjust to the spacing and shot the ball well enough to be respectable. Paolo, on the other hand, is more equipped with perimeter skills and handling and ball screens at a younger age, and I expect that to continue to grow with post touches becoming a more crucial aspect of his game. Franz Wagner, on the other hand, likely surprised people with his ability to play on the ball so quickly, but the indicators were there prior to his arrival in the NBA. You can see that his pre-NBA pick and roll reps jumped during his stints with the German national team, and his decision to play American college basketball was driven by a desire to grow and display more of that skill set. The EuroLeague on a level is better than, way better than college, but it's it's a completely different style, so learning college can, you know, sometimes even prepare you a little, a little better uh, when, when you play 30, 35 minutes a game there and get to take a lot of responsibility opposed to, you know, getting 20 minutes a game and kind of playing off the ball all the time, you know. At this stage, and likely going forward, that's made possible by a number of things. The first is that he's definitely the more respectable shooter of the two, although there is a lot of room for growth. Franz has a quick, efficient motion, and he's lethal if left open, hitting 49.5% of his catch-and-shoot threes on those looks. The dribble shooting, however, is going to be key, as he's been wobblier, especially in tighter spaces against hard closeouts and with attached defenders. This season, he's only converted 25.3% of his dribble pull-up threes in the pick and roll, but there can be some noisy variants in there. I'm a believer. Defenses still respect him. He's converting a solid 1.33 points per possession when defenders go under screens, and he's an aggressive, confident player who eagerly claims space as defenses contest him uphill. This is made possible by the fact that he is powerfully built with the lower body of a fucking centaur. Terrifically balanced and able to make secure, long strides while often making at times bafflingly difficult angular high glass finishes over rim protectors, it could be a case of growing up and constantly finishing against a taller, older brother. His brother Mo happens to be playing significant minutes on this very roster and playing pretty well. Watch the respect that Franz gets from Davion Mitchell here as he eagerly tries to anticipate getting over this screen, which Franz sees and quickly chooses to reverse his path so that Mitchell is on Wendell Carter Jr.'s back with a driving lane in front of him. Rashawn Holmes is focused on the threat of him scoring, which Franz parlays into a lob for Carter. And look how happy he is. It's far from a certainty, but the indicators for both of these players are frightening at times, assuming they continue to develop. There's a world where they both become above average handlers or screeners in ball screens. They both have a healthy dose of post offense when mismatches call for it, with playmaking rippling out from those actions while they both knock down threes at a decent clip. At that point, the rest of the league anxiously sets their eyes on the Epcot Center and says, uh oh. And it only gets weirder from there. Wendell Carter Jr. is a great place to start. As we said, Carter has settled in as Franz's most frequent and efficient pick and roll partner at 1.19 points per possession. And he's finally begun to showcase the spatially balanced game that we all assumed that he could offer. He's hitting on 37.6% of his spot up threes and putting up three and a half attempts per game, tied for the highest in his career. He's one of a number of tantalizing big guys on the roster, leading to lineups and more specifically sequences like this one that are just laughably absurd. An art exhibition 
definition of postmodern basketball. While sheer size and length are the obvious talking point of this roster, redemption is a major storyline. Bull Bull has, at least for the time being, seemingly found a home in Orlando and has finally enjoyed some increased opportunity to utilize all of those wild gifts that simultaneously wowed us and worried us before the 2019 draft. It's like his reach is amplified. Some things are fashionable but not entirely functional, and for a time I felt like that was true with Bowl. His high points were visually astonishing. It's just that we weren't getting to see him grow during the more mundane moments. But this is the first time in Bowl's career that he's been able to have mundane moments because he's actually healthy and he's actually getting to play. Although his three-point shooting has dipped from a hot start and questions about his reliability defensively still linger, it's nice to see him have the opportunity to figure things out. An equally or greater feel-good story has been the quiet redemption of former number one pick Markel Fultz. Fultz has already been to hell and back in his short career. On paper, hypothetically, in the summer of 2017, he seemed like the perfect defense-bending shot creator to balance Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons in Philly, but that idea completely failed to launch. His relationship with the Sixers ended badly, and he was shipped to Orlando, where he had one bumpy but active season with his new team, only to turn around and tear his ACL the following year before he could build on it. This year, and knock on every piece of available wood, we're back, baby. Slowly but surely, he's ironed some of the troublesome wrinkles out of that jumper, and he's worked his way into being one of the more reliably fluid offensive pieces for Orlando, and consistently capable on defense, which led him to more or less wrestling the starting job away from Jalen Suggs and Cole Anthony. This season, through 34 outings, he's averaging 5.5 assists per game and 13 points per game on 55.1% true shooting. In fact, I think we've reached a point where you're competitive to point out that Markel Fultz is a better and more valuable player than Ben Simmons. And who on earth saw that coming? The other looming factor here is Jonathan Isaac, and I say this in all seriousness, I don't think people are talking about this enough. Before the utter betrayal by his knees, Isaac was blossoming into one of the most promising defensive prospects in the entire sport. Big, long, and springy enough to cleanly high point block someone like Rudy Gobert, and laterally mobile enough to mirror handlers and challenge and recover in open space. Pair that with his presence as a lob threat and his competency from three, and you're unlocking some wildly versatile lineups for Orlando. If he can get and stay healthy, it's a simmering volcano of a subplot for this team, a potential ace in the hole for their defensive identity. Capable pieces are there, and if there's one person on the roster most likely to become a point of attack terror, I think it's Jalen Suggs. It's been a bumpy ride for the former number five pick. He's been in and out of the lineup and often struggled to be efficient as a finisher and from beyond the arc. That said, the build of this roster, not terribly dissimilar similar from Milwaukee in that bigger players handle a lot of the facilitation while the wings and smaller guards attack in the creases that are created, takes some pressure off of him to be a savior point guard and to instead focus on his strengths. You know, I don't think I've ever interrupted one of my own videos, but I have to see that again. <laughs> The Magic play a lot of guys because they have a lot of guys. Gary Harris has had one of the best shooting and decision-making seasons of his career, and I've barely heard a word about it from anyone. Caleb Houston still seems like he might be a steal because of his size and ability to space. He just needs some opportunities to play. And it's unlikely that Cole Anthony will be dissuaded from being his hyper-confident self, which could work in doses on a good team. Maybe. However you want to slice it, inevitable shakeup was on the horizon for this team. And the eclecticness that came in their pursuit of keeper players will very likely normalize a bit as they sharpen their focus. Accelerant. I've always liked that word. It has a nice music to it. Accelerants bolster and expedite. They can enhance, spark, intensify an existing dynamic and send it into a frenzied state. Granted, they can get you arrested in some areas of life, but in basketball, on offense, at least to me, they refer to decisive and skillful ex execution, ball movement, shooting, and spacing. To my eye, this is the accelerant that Orlando desperately needs. 
Per 100 possessions, this Orlando team is near the bottom of the league in passes made, assists, and secondary assists. As fun as I'd imagine all of this is to dissect and ponder for Orlando fans, in the immortal words of Andre 3000, nothing is for sure, nothing is for certain. And while this is a young group, and there's plenty of time to figure things out, they're entering the phase where critical choices will be made that'll decide whether or not this core will perform Act 2 and get within reach of the promised land again. I don't want to overstate things, it's just that the Eastern Conference is a savage battleground with bloodthirsty behemoths prowling the terrain, and they ain't going anywhere. There are no magic words for this part, no supernatural ritual to easy button what comes next. The exciting times ahead will likely be counterbalanced by the things that come with a pivot from experimenting to legitimately attempting to win big. Hard lessons, anxiousness, and expectations. I doubt this crew is daunted by any of that, and the climb has only just begun. Let me know if you agree.